now. And uh, but don't worry, in Dave's stead, we have uh, Vim, aka the Wildebeest, back. And, and Brian will be coming back on Tuesday. And of course, uh, James will be arriving at some point during the day today. And uh, he'll be on drive again from tomorrow. So let's find out how Jamie's trip towards the Lions is going. Morning, Orbs. Uh... Good morning, and we are racing on our way to get to those lions on their buffalo kill. And I'm really, really hoping that after the dramatic scenes of last night, that we will have something to sit and feel joyful about. And I'm thinking, perhaps the presence of eight little cubs would be a very, very nice surprise. But we're heading through there now to double check. And of course, there's also three males in that area. So last night, very, very dramatic scenes. And it came entirely as a surprise. But first of all, my name is Jamie and I have Jandre on camera with me. We did actually say hello and good morning to you earlier, but we, um, we apparently it didn't quite go live. So hello and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. But yes, what I was going to say was yesterday afternoon was turning into one of those drives that's just a sort of a casual bumble. I think we'd seen one water buck and two Dacre for the duration of that afternoon's drive and a juvenile Marshall Eagle flying around. Now, it was one of those things that was just turning into a quiet drive until we trundled along Hyena Road. And I promise you, not two seconds before those buffalo came running out with the lions behind them, Jandre go can I tell them the story, Jandre? <laughs> Jandre goes, Hyena Road is the least productive road. I have never seen anything on this road. <laughs> and with that, buff a herd of buffalo came belting out of the bushes, being followed by five lions. So, you know. Perhaps Jandre should say those things more often. At all times, Jandre, every road we go down, Jandre must say, we see nothing on this road, and then we'll see something. Anyway, it turned into some very interesting driving, um, and we were struggling with signal, trying to call Brent in and tell him where to go, at the same time trying to work out where Brent should go, because it all depended upon where the lions were going to go with that buffalo. And it was absolutely amazing. It was the, the entire scene was heartbreaking and your heart sort of sits in the back of your throat somewhere when you're watching something like that and it was amazing to see their coordination and the way that they did it because it was almost half-hearted that initial chase the female was sprinting she wasn't even flat out sprinting she was just running after that buffalo the other females stayed exactly where they were and just watched for a while and waited until they could see which direction she was guiding this buffalo in and then shot off afterwards in that direction. So the coordination was truly, truly phenomenal. Very special to see. And then again, it was so incredibly raw and incredibly heartbreaking for that poor buffalo because it was a big buffalo bull. They didn't have any males with them, so it was a slow, long process. And then, of course, there was the brief and rather intense moment where Jandre and myself managed to make it up onto a very narrow, narrower than this damn wall, narrow strip of earth where they had the buffalo. And he, whether through panic or I don't, I don't know what it was exactly that caused it, I think it might even have just been blind direction, although he, he did, I watched the footage again and he did look at us and then run towards us. And I mean, 800, 900 kilograms of terrified buffalo with a lion on top of it, there were moments when I had a brief vision of lions ending up on the bonnet. You know, if he'd hit the bonnet, then the lion... Not. Listen. Go find them. Are you done yet? Yeah, let's go. It's a very, very difficult patch of off roading, and I still have to f try and figure out and work out exactly where the best spot to go in is because we had some intensely interesting moments last night trying to get there. 
Oh yes, um, talking about the buffalo running towards us. So we went black screen as that happened. It was totally unintentional. It, we just lost signal, which I can imagine looked terrifying. But all we did was we just reversed a couple of meters and the lions turned the buffalo around. Now, nothing too dramatic. Well, it was an interesting moment because I was aware that there was a sheer drop somewhere, but not exactly where, where it was. And then just like that, we watched the, the buffalo tumble down into the drainage. And I knew it was over at that point because there was no way he would have been injured from that fall. And the whole thing just turned into a... It's, it's awe-inspiring in a way. And I don't mean that in a, a joy at something's death, but I just mean in terms of watching the power and the brutality of the lionesses, but at the same time knowing they've got little cubs that they have to feed, they have to feed themselves looking at their empty bellies. It was just very, very raw and a truly incredible experience. And I've never witnessed a lion hunt from the perspective that we were, or lion kill actually, from the perspective we were at looking down at them send you back over to Brent. Okay, I'm going to concentrate on getting into the sighting. I think that the best way is going to be through here. Wasn't that I'm going absolutely to incredible what happened last night? And while I, do I wonder that, if the cubs are there now, so Jamie should find out shortly. Now, I'll search for the queen. Now, this is an area that Carrillo has been spending a lot of time in. It's going to be very interesting now that those cubs are bigger, whether she's going to move further north and stop going south out of our Travis area as much. Fingers crossed, of course. Michael says he's just started his bird list and only has 37 species to date. Well, Michael, let's wonder if you have those species. Don't fly away, you evil little creatures. You got them there? Opposite bank now, all on one tree. Um, here we go. Okay. Okay, so zoom to the left. Um, down. Oh, they're all gone. <laughs> As I looked, hey, well, Michael, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait for number 38. Those birds all disappeared. Um, uh, so if, if you are new, uh, quite a few of our viewers have a bird species. A list that of the birds we see on live safari. And some people are over 200 already. So Michael's are well on his way with 37. And he'll try to find 38, 39 and 40. This is another favorite spot of Karula's along this little river system. But, Michael, you'll be glad to know, not only is it a good spot for Karula, it's a good spot for birds as well. Now remember, we are live. And you can ask us questions about what we're up to, what we're doing, and all the wonderful creatures of Africa. And you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv. Now, a lot of our regulars would have heard me say that many, many times over the last year and a half or so. But can you believe on my interview drive, I could not get that right? I literally mixed it up in every way possible. Questions at tv.live. I could not, for some reason, get it right. Okay, so no sign of any tracks. I'm going to head back down towards 
Philemon. Actually, I think I'm going to check Treehouse Down first. Uh, but before we go there, hello. Little Inyalas. Of course, they are always wanting to avoid the Queen Karula. That's a young male. And the orange one was a female that walked past. Okay, well, why are you standing behind the tree, Mr. Inyara? Go forward slightly. Here we go. <laughs> of course. Back through to the bushes. So we're going to keep heading towards the treehouse waterhole. Hopefully we find the cooler lounging on next to it. With cubs running around. Morning, Shamsung. Uh, Shamsung is wondering, where do you get these bird lists from and how do they work? Well, Shamsung, as far as my understanding is, every time we see a bird on the live drive, you just write it down on your list, or you can write it on your computer, and uh, that's how the bird lists work. I'm pretty sure if you would like to have a set bird list to work from, I'm not sure where, but somewhere on the World Wide Web, You'll be able to download a bird list for the Kruger National Park would be a good one. And you can work off that. Of course, we don't have all the species that are in the Kruger, but we should have most of them. OK, come on. Fingers crossed. Tracks. And we have it tracks of an impala, more impala, and another impala. Oh dear. As I said, we're heading towards the treehouse waterhole. This area is a, a favourite of Karula's. Although I have that sort of niggling gut feeling that she could be still around the Mawati. We've already driven a section of the Mawati this morning and no tracks. Who knows, maybe she just pounced on another animal right next to the last one she caught. It is always a bit possible. This is incredible after the rain. So on cheetah plains, we could see there was a little bit of a green flush coming out. But if we look closely, these baboon tails are springing some sprouts after that rain. And I guess in two or three days, we're going to have those be beautiful little lilac flowers that come out of them. Always good to listen for a few seconds. Nope. No noises. Just the tinkling of a rattling cesticula in the drainage line. Okay, come, Kula. Be lounging into the treehouse wall. So we're approaching the treehouse wall. Hole. What is going to be there? Dave, any guesses? Dave has gone for the Karula. Will she be here? We'll find out in a few short seconds. And we are arriving at the treehouse waterhole, and there is absolutely nothing. So, on that note, uh, let's go to something a big, hairy, and scary with Jamie. Scary indeed, and here we have 
the final result of the scene that we witnessed last night. A Birmingham boy attempting to pull the carcass a little bit away and feeding on what's still a lot of meat. They've only eaten a little bit of the rump. They haven't even removed the com stomach contents yet. And from what I can see of our lionesses, the Birmingham boys haven't even allowed them to properly feed on this carcass yet. That is the lot of a lioness when three males come in to try and steal your kill, despite the fact that they have enormously full bellies, and watching patiently in the wings, as we were hoping for, three tiny little lion cubs. I bet you haven't had a chance to sit on the carcass yet, have you? Hello. I think this is our, our oldest group, but I'm actually not 100%. Yeah, it must be, because there's three of them. Oh, you're getting very brave. That's very brave. That's very, very brave. <laughs> I'm patiently waiting, hey? What you got there? Is that a stump? <laughs> Is that very scary? Oh, this is absolutely incredible. And scenes like this make what we witnessed easier, a little bit harder to, or a bit easier to bear. Little lion cubs playing with a meal that will keep their moms sustained, and themselves as well, as they start to learn to eat meat. Energy to keep up this game that they've started. Can you believe you're watching this live? Something that still astounds me. Oh, oh, oh! Oh, what happened, what happened to your face? Did you get a thorn? <laughs> oh, I can hear more cubs up at the top as well. So the whole family is here. I can hear little growling, begging sounds from the top of the drainage, which is where we were yesterday. We were sitting on top there, looking down on the entire scene, and up there somewhere, our little cubs growling. Might be able to hear them. <laughs> and one little cub watching intently as maybe dad feeds. Oh, you got a stick. Yeah, luckily for them, there's plenty to keep them occupied down here in the drainage line system before they have a chance to feed off the carcass. <laughs> See? He hasn't let them near the carcass. Standing by. Here comes Mom to watch what's going on. Mm -hmm. Oh, listen to the sounds that are coming. Uh, Orbs, are you coming along in Yala Road North? Just keep coming. Oh, Orbs, sorry. I was trying to say don't go in Yala Road, uh, Hyena Road. Don't go Hyena Road. There's a big scorver in the way. You won't be able to get visual. Oh, sorry, Orbs, I've got your audio now. Now, um, come Nyala Road North, it's going to be the only way you'll see them. Sorry, guys. So what happened there was Amber Eyes was getting a little bit irritated with the actions of the cub, and also her... she was playing. It was a playful instinct with the cubs. Then she wanted to go and try and feed, and the Birmingham boy chased her away. This is probably what they've done all night. And you can actually see from Amber Eyes' stomach that she hasn't eaten. She's, maybe she's had a couple of mouthfuls this way. 
but the Birmingham boy has taken the lion's share. He's been clearly very protective over the entire carcass the whole night, which is interesting because they all arrived with full bellies from eating a dead elephant on Buffles Hook. The cubs definitely won't even have got a nose in to this particular situation. They will have to wait their turn. And it's not like a wild dog pack where the cubs are the high, or the pups, sorry, the youngest member of the group are the most high ranking and are treated as such by all of the adults. In a lion pride, the lion cubs are absolutely the bottom of the food chain. Their moms might look after them, as she did now, when she got up to make sure that her babies were absolutely safe. But they are absolutely the bottom of the food chain. Their moms might look after them, as she did now, when she got up to make sure that her babies were absolutely safe. But other than that, they have to fend for themselves, even when they are at such a young age. Luckily, there's siblings to practice their fighting skills on. Oh, you're very brave. Interesting. Much more tolerant of the cub than he is of the adult lionesses. Oh, you're going to get a smack, little one. And that's also not the best place to try and go and tackle the carcass. Uh, you're big and fierce, but not quite big and fierce enough just yet. Oh, wow, how's that for an image? Maybe not. Actually, playing's a bit more fun than trying to break through thick buffalo skin. Especially when you've got one mom and two aunties lactating to provide a little bit of extra food. Now just to let you know, when this situation changes, if the lions come a bit closer to us... Oh! My goodness! So noisy! If the situation changes, then we will be attempting to record a VR clip. <laughs> However, at the moment we can't push any closer. The male gave us a tail thrashing look as we came in, obviously because he's still feeling very possessive over a carcass that he played absolutely no role in taking down. Uh, when the, if the lions do come a bit closer then we'll be able to do a VR recording and then we will stop sort of answering questions or anything like that and we'll put that on record. And I promise you it will definitely be entirely worth your while. And David in Napa, <clears throat> while we watch the females finally get to feed a little bit on a, on a buffalo that they killed entirely by themselves, David wants to know when lionesses do go in for a kill, is there a role that each one specifically adopts um, in terms of positioning? Maybe one is always on top of the animal, one is designated to the throat hold and so on. Well, David, there's a, a lot of research, and it's really appropriate that we're talking about this while we're looking at the amber-eyed lioness, because she very often takes the sort of front role in the hunting that they do, as well as the young lioness, the youngest lioness of the group. And David, there's a lot of research being done into the way that lionesses coordinate the attacks. Almost invariably, what I've seen with the Inkahumas is one or two lionesses shoot off in pursuit of the prey, the others seem to hang back and just wait until the prey decides which direction it's going to go in, which is exactly what happened yesterday. Yes, that's really nice, mister. And that is male lions for one. They are, play a big role in defending territory and keeping the lionesses and their cubs safe from incoming males, although bearing in mind, of course, when they came in, they killed two, 
two, three, four of the Inkahumas, apparently. Two of them were before my time and were resulted in Junior being removed. So they basically reduced the Inkahumas from ten at the start of last year to five now. But now they play a very important role in protecting their cubs. But despite the fact that he has been feeding on, a bu on an elephant for the last few days, he won't let the lionesses feed. He wants his lion share first, and he's got an extra at least, I'd say for him, Birmingham boys are not big, but he's got at least 100 kilograms on these lionesses, so 220 odd pounds heavier. Oh, it's just so, it's one of those things that we as human beings watch and it seems so blatantly unfair, since the lionesses played an enormous role in taking, well they did, they took this buffalo down on their own, the males just turned up at the end. And that's just how lions work. Now one thing he will be useful for is now that they've brought their cubs here, he will be really useful in terms of keeping hyenas at bay. And it's not just him, there is actually another male lion lying at the top of the drainage line, some of you may have spotted. So they've got an inbuilt defense system against hyenas, which is good for the safety of the cubs. But it would be very nice if perhaps he would let everybody have a meal. But they're not human, and our human ideas of fairness definitely do not apply here. He seems to have lost out, though. He's so busy being big and scary, he ended up with the raw end of the deal, which is the head and the jaw. And there's not very much left on there. And Michael, yes, that is why the male is more tolerant of the little cubs, because he is their bloodline, or they are his bloodline, or vice versa, however you want to see it. The lionesses are not. They are merely vectors, basically, to pass on his genetic material. Oh, yummy. <laughs> I need the stomach contents. That's not the part you meant to eat. That's the yucky bit. No, little one. Almost. Oh. He's going to growl at her again. You can see the lioness already, not even wanting to risk it. Yes, yeah, so yes, Michael, that's why he shares a bit more leniently with the cubs. <coughs> Submissive posture. how protective she is over the cubs and the cubs immediately set about yowling their displeasure right and now that he's established who's boss off he goes to urinate on a bush and the cubs actually <laughs> that spray just hit the cub in front and now that he's eaten his full the lionesses can finally oh little cub are you stalking dad There were some amazing displays of their behavior right there. The lioness is now tucking in with relish now that the, li the male lion has moved off. You see their submissive behavior. Interesting how he felt the need to growl at them and put them in their place, even though he wasn't interested in eating anything more. Oh, and some big fierce predator sounds coming from the little cubs, and then some actual genuinely fierce predator sounds coming from the females. And David, sorry, we were talking about lionesses and their hunting strategy. And I don't think that they have definitive roles. I think that they decided on the spur of the moment, depending upon who is where, and who actually managed to jump up on the back of the buffalo, for example, or which lioness has to brave the front. A lot of the time the hunt will be led by more experienced lionesses. 
but I've noticed that when sub-adult lionesses get to sort of adult age, they start to initiate the hunt more and more frequently, I think, to practice, to be completely honest with you. I think that instinct really, truly kicks in at that point. And a lot of research is being done into the black back of their ears and the way in which they use that to direct their attentions and where they go and what they do. Like arrows or hand signals. Like hand signals, like a SWAT team using hand signals, except it's their ears. And we've got some fierce predator action happening from the cub side, pinned to the ground. I'm, I suspect we've got two males and a female in this particular group, although the change isn't, I mean, the difference isn't terribly noticeable at this point. Aubrey, Aubrey. Uh, what's your position? Oh, sorry, Orbs. I wasn't sure if those tracks would lead in here, but keep coming north, along in Yala Road North, and I'll tell you when I've got your audio, because I got your audio, but you're too far south. Sorry, guys, just directing Aubrey into the sighting. Oh, little cubs. We finally got a chance to have a snack now that that male has moved off. And I think that the other females... <laughs> Look at this one trying to clam clamber up the mountain buffalo. Mount buffalo. <laughs> Mount buffalo is definitely... A little bit too big of a climb right now for such little such a little creature. And as sharp as your teeth are, you are not going to break through the skin there. Okay, oops, I've got your audio, just keep coming. A grisly scene, and yet at the same time, kind of a really contented family scene. <laughs> one of those strange, I don't know what one would call it, dichotomies of life. Little cubs feeding happily away at a buffalo carcass. I don't, the other cubs are further up outside of the drainage line, as I said, and I don't think the female wants to risk bringing them down here with the males behaving as aggressively as they are. They're still a little bit young. But it was fascinating to watch that whole scene play out and how defensive the mother became, and the little cubs rushing to her side. Not that the males would harm the cubs, as we discussed with Michael's question. They're more likely to harm the females than they are to harm cubs that they think are their own. You little one. Now, deja vu. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. This is such a, such a weird scene. So adorable and yet so grisly at the same time. Deja vu would like to know, is it learned behavior or instinctive behavior? And I actually really need to use the game drive comments, but sorry, just bear with me one second. It is instinctive. as though our time might be breaking up. I'm going to to Brent. Wow! Isn't that amazing? The cubs, the males, the ladies, the action, the drama of the Nkahumas. And uh, we've got a sedate old, well not too old man, but 
Nice. Of any ball. There he is. Hello, mister. Enjoying your cumbretum? So probably around 30-ish, maybe a little bit older. You can see that slight colour in the sky behind. Now we haven't seen any really big illy balls for a while. I'm hoping they do make an appearance soon. And yeah, the fork-tailed drongo in the background, chirping away. Oh, he's not going to be too far away from that elephant in case that Ellie manages to disturb an insect or three. Oh, I do enjoy elephant balls. Look at this, this is incredible. Get that marula. <laughs> Incredible power. Now, the marula trees are very much trimmed by the eddies, and it's the big bulls who can reach those high branches. And now, with the drought, they're actually the smaller branches of a marula are what they're eating. There's no real leaves, and they actually eat the whole branch at the moment. Now what happens with the younger branches is that, of course, the trees are pumping nutrients in them for them to grow. So it's a nice meal if you're an elephant. And of course you have to eat a lot of them. You know, if you're just eating the whole, whole, whole little branchlet, Hey, mister. I'm very, very sedate. I'm just trying to listen to see if he's on his own or he's hanging on the peripheries of a larger herd. But from what I can hear so far, he's flying solo. And that's not uncommon with elephant bulls, unless they're in must. I quite often will spend the majority of their time either wandering solo or in small bachelor groups. Now, there could be some more bulls around that we can't see. Uh, they can communicate with each other over quite big distances, so there could be some more bulls around but he's rumbling too that we can't even hear. A lot of the elephant communication is, is in such a low, I think it's is it decibel? Low decibel that we can't hear. Hey, big boy. He might give us a little head shake. Yes, we're right here. He's opened his ears up. He's just reminding us how big he is and that we shouldn't cause any trouble with him. You see the one ear is closing already. He's now decided he's already showed us how impressive he is and that we are su sufficiently warned. Sometimes that open ear is coupled with a, a nice head shake. I'm just going to let him move behind us. I'm not going to move the car. If he's smelling us, you see how he points his trunk towards us. There we go. Off to the next bush willow. It's got some leaves. Now I'm just going to roll forward and then turn around. Oh, I thought we were on more of a slab. I thought I could just silently sneak off, but I'm not going to start. The vehicle now very important especially when an elephant's this close is that i'm going to start the car and i let it run now to start and move even though the elephants in the sabi sands are, are, are incredibly relaxed around vehicles it's always good practice because you never know we might be somewhere where the elephants aren't so relaxed there we go you can see 
the car noise isn't bothering me at all, so now I'm going to move. And he isn't even moving his head, he's carrying on eating, so I'm just going to turn around. And there we go. Get up this bump to make life easier for Dave on camera. There we go. Now, Diane's wondering how to tell. An elephant's age, and there's one of the ways to tell how sunken their temples are. Diane, that only really works for incredibly old animals, and you'll notice this year because of the drought, there could be a few more sunken temples just because of lack of quality food. But that generally only works with older elephants. When elephants uh, are particularly females, are much harder to age than the bulls, or for me anyway. There might be someone who's better at it than me. But sunken temples is one of the things we, we look at, but we look at lots of different things uh, that'll help age an elephant. Uh, with bulls, for me, it's shoulder height. Uh, you can see he's very, very tall. So I'd say he's coming into his prime at the moment. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to wait, let's stick with him while he feeds along. Okay, so we're not going to look at his back end, let's move around to his front end. Now, for me, let's just see what he does here. I think he might lift up some of those dead branches to try and get at the fresh branches underneath. Oh no, he's going for the, the bush willow. And you notice how he's feeling. He's only picking on the very young branches that are probably having the, which almost definitely have the most nutrients. Where, oh no, he doesn't, no, doesn't like that. Just drop them. Go behind us again, Mister. <laughs> so he grabbed a bunch of leaves from that bush willow and decided, nope, not tasty enough. I'm going to move on. And now, looking at his behaviour, you can see he's completely relaxed with us. Now he might give us a another ear opening and stuff, and that's just, that's quite common with elephant bulls, they do that, and maybe shake his head at us, he's just reminding us that he's a big boy and not to be trifled with. Oh, I think he might go up, look at this, it's too high, it's too high, no! Oh, 
out of his reach. Oh, there we go. He's got to leave. Oh, well done, big boy. He's looking a bit embarrassed that he couldn't reach that. Now, because of the drought, we're watching an elephant feed off a torchwood, and that, that isn't... If they had a choice... Oh, look, 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 look. Incredible. Now, in some parts of Africa, elephants are known to balance on their back legs to get higher. I've only ever seen it once in the Sabi Sands. Maybe this morning will be twice. I was going to do it again. looking, trying to spot a branch that's within his grasp. No, he's decided they're all too high. Might move on to the next torchwood. Here he goes. No, no he's decided they're all too high. Might move on to the next torchwood. Here he goes. Now, elephants, when they have a choice, generally don't eat torchwoods. But now, with the drought, oh, shame! Oh, oh, yes! Yes, I've got it! That click click was just my camera. It's such an impressive sight seeing an elephant at full stretch. I really do I love spending time with Ellie Balls. I'm pretty sure he's gonna do it again. Everyone ready? Okay, let's see, he's nearly finished that. And there we go. He's got there. Isn't this just spectacular? <laughs> He's trying to make sure he gets a bigger piece. Oh dear. And he's weakened that branch. So he doesn't want to pull the smaller bits off. He's trying to get that bigger branch. But it... Oh! Unfortunately for him, it doesn't seem like it worked that time. Now, an elephant trunk is a very complex piece of anatomy. And Curtis is wondering, how do all the muscles work? Well, there's about 100,000 muscles and, and tendons and ligaments in the elephant's trunk. And some of them attach from muscle to muscle. And uh, they don't, the ones from the tip don't go all the way through to the skull. Um, and there's lots of little uh, muscles and tendons. And as I said, over 100,000. That gives it that incredible dexterity. And of course, quite a bit of cartilage that gives it, firms it up a bit. Mm. 
munch, munch, munch. Now, that is a torchwood, also known as a green thorn, and they have massive thorns on them. And as you can see, an elephant's mouth is as tough as an old boot, and just chews straight through those thorns. Such a peaceful, peaceful experience sitting with an elephant bull. And uh, we're going to, oh wait, let's have a look, maybe one last stretch. Come on, one last stretch. Nope. Uh, well, oh no. Here we go. Let's see. Let's see what he does. He's going to move off shortly. There's very few branches he can reach. So uh, we're going to do the same. We're going to keep checking for leopard tracks. Unfortunately, we haven't seen any of those yet, but it was incredible spending some time with this Ellie bull. Uh, but let's go back to Jamie and the incredible Inkahumas. What an awesome morning spent with two of Africa's most iconic animals, the lion and the elephant. And right now we have two very sleepy miniature lions who have exhausted themselves through their endeavours of nibbling away at their buffalo breakfast. Now just to warn some people, we've repositioned in order to give Aubrey and his guests a better view. There isn't really much space around here to get into a good spot. So they've managed to make their way down here. So for those of you who are a little bit squeamish, buffalo kills are gruesome. All kills are gruesome. <laughs> you got a little cup at the back. All that growling and then there's this, this little head nibbling away at the hip bones. <laughs> You're a canny little thing. Oh yes, you might every now and again see images that are a little bit macabre and a bit unsettling, depending upon where the planet is. Chandra and myself were just greeted to a vision of the buffaloes, which isn't looking terribly good right now. So the lions are feasting away. Unfortunately, we don't have the clearest position of the gold right now. This is a perfect spot for us to have what is going on. Rowls the females as they compete with each other for the best possible eating spot. So I think the cloud's playing a bit of havoc with uh, rusty signal, so hopefully Jamie's going to be able to reposition into a good spot. Now, I've heard a report that there were male lions calling in this area. And there's only two Birminghams on uh, the buffalo carcass. So it could be a lion here. But I'm really hoping to find just one leopard track that we can follow. And uh, these cold, cloudy mornings, not good for birding as well. And and James, who's in Springs, South Africa, uh, was wondering what we do if we come across an elephant bull like that on foot. Now, James, every single scenario is different. Uh, quite often with Ellie bulls, it's, they're incredible to encounter on foot, uh, especially in areas where they, they're not persecuted or poached. They're very, very, very cool animals. I've actually had one with its trunk sniff my hair while I was sitting under a tree very quietly and calmly and uh, I was very lucky my dad taught me a lot about walking into elephants from a very young age um, and my first my first memory is actually on foot with an elephant that wasn't on purpose though I got into trouble for that um, 
It was in northern Botswana. Oh, hello. Oh no, off it goes at high speed, like most den boggies. Yeah, little antelope disappearing. Oh, he stops, but in the thicket. And so as I was saying, so I know a lot of you have heard this story before, but uh, my parents stopped for a sundowner around a pan in northern Botswana in Mareni Game Reserve. And I was two, about two years old. I was a highly mobile child, apparently, uh, whether it be on all fours or apparently as soon as I got my two legs working, it was a nightmare to keep track of me. And I disappeared off from my, there was an Eddie Bull drinking at the pan, and my dad turned around and just saw me couple of meters away from this elephant bull talking to it um, and he managed to walk up very carefully pick me up thank the elephant and give me a hiding <laughs> but uh, um, we can chat a little bit more about Ellie's on foot uh, later because Jamie's got signal with the lions right up morning and we are still with our lionesses feasting on the buffalo nobody move or breathe because if we do we might lose signal but so far, so good. We seem to be okay. It's one of the reasons why we're in the position that we're in. And there you go. Macabre view of our buffalo skull. Funnily enough, both Brent and myself have both stopped at this buffalo bull in the last two days to talk about it. It was the one with the blind right eye. Brent stopped it with it yesterday morning, and I stopped with it the day before. is crunching away and I really mean it when I say they probably judging by their empty bellies they probably never got to have more than a couple of mouthfuls of this buffalo before the males came in last night Genre and myself actually encountered the males as they were racing in it was a very interesting experience because we were trying to get out of a very tricky spot I was concentrating on off-roading and the next thing this the air around us erupted in roars there was one male lion about a meter away from us on one side and one couple of meters away on the other. And Jandra and I, I was talking about it last night, we both levitated out of our seats because there came as such a surprise. They just sort of snuck in out of the darkness. My, my car lights didn't even pick them up and all of a sudden there were just roars all around us. It was an incredibly intense experience. But they were clearly racing straight towards the distress calls that they heard from the buffalo. Our time at the sighting is unfortunately limited. As you can imagine, there are lots and lots of people that would like to come and see it. And because of the little ones that are present here, and there's actually two sets, as I mentioned earlier, just one that we can't see at the moment, and then our little bundle of delectable monsters over there, because of them, it is only a two-vehicle sighting. So only two vehicles are going to be allowed into this particular spot. So we will enjoy the most time that we can here and then we will pull out. But bear with me one moment because I do just need to chat to Abel and find out where he is. Abel, Abel. And then what we will do is come back to this position at the end of the sunrise safari. What's your position? Okay, copy. I was just wondering which vehicle. I thought you were on first standby for these Ngala. I know you said you'd make a big loop, but just let me know when you're in the area. Okay, so we've still got more time than I thought, actually. Because the person who is coming in first to see them is still very, very far away. So we can actually enjoy some time with our fierce and Kahuma hunters. Now, of course, most of you will have noticed by now that there are only four here. And that is because it is the amber-eyed female, the youngest female, and the amber-eyed female is actually very clearly identifiable with that scar. Just realized that that scar is very prominent on her right shoulder, and we will always be able to identify her. There you go. Don't know how that happened. Maybe hunting, maybe mating. Or maybe even trying to feed off a carcass with the male. So they are here, and the mothers of the two oldest set of cubs are here as well. The ones that we've been watching play, 
and then the set that I can hear squalling up somewhere in the bushes somewhere. The other female has probably gone through to where she's keeping the littlest members of the Unkohuma pride. There's three tiny, tiny cubs that we've been watching around Buffelzook Dam. She's probably gone to go and feed them, and she will be back a little bit later, perhaps even to bring them to their first ever kill, although they are still very, very tiny. But perhaps, perhaps, today is the day we will get to see those little cubs at their first ever kill. Tucking in, forcing the skin back. It's not an easy job eating a buffalo. It's not quite as difficult as killing a buffalo, but it's not easy. The meat is f incredibly tough. When we watch it, it's not... It, they have to put in a great deal of effort. I love that little cub's head every now and again, by the way. Popping up over the rump there. Oh, just an ear. Just an ear. Tucking in to the scraps. But it is very difficult. The skin is phenomenally tough. It's also very well attached to the muscles by connective tissue. So the, lion, it, the lions feeding off it have to exert a phenomenal amount of effort to pull back the skin and get to the meat underneath. Last night we watched the pride take down this buffalo from start to finish. Justin is, you wanted to know about how long it takes a pride to kill a buffalo. It depends on the pride. So it depends on the size of the buffalo and it depends on the, the number of lions and it depends on whether or not they've got males with them. Last night there were only five females. The, the females are weaker than the males. They're not as strong and they're not as good at sort of exerting that strength that the males have in order to bring the buffalo down and suffocate it. And very often male lions will take point on this sort of thing. So the less males there are and the less lions there are altogether will mean the longer the process is for that particular buffalo. Now last night, how long did it take, Chandra? An hour? I don't know, it all went, it's all such a blur that I'm not 100% sure. No, maybe less. Might have taken them about 40 minutes. Now, it must have been about 40 minutes that they took to kill the buffalo. And that was a situation where you had five lionesses and no assistance from any of the males. Not that the males didn't get to reap the rewards. gruesome bloody faces, the females finally reaping the rewards. Liz, when we saw this buffalo I mentioned that we both commented on him and Brent and myself both mentioned when we saw him that he was quite an old boy. Oh hello, have you emerged? The full belly. Sorry, we'll get back to the buffalo in a moment. Let's just see what this little cub does. I think it's going to use the rest of the cubs as pillows. Standard lion lack of personal space, just sitting on top of each other. Something that will continue throughout the rest of their lives. Cleaning off the buffalo. Oh. So, so cute. Yep, better start cleaning off the remains of Buffalo, little one. Okay, copy. I will start pulling out in a moment. Sorry, guys, we've got to the end of the time that we can spend with this particular kill. He got there much faster than I expected. In fact, I'm, I'm quite amazed at the speed at which that happened. So just a quick answer to Liz's question about how old this buffalo was, I would guess at around maybe 12, 13 years old. Possibly even older, but it's hard, now it's hard to look back and remember exactly how old I, pick, I sort of thought it would be. What we can do is we can examine the lower jaw, not right now, I don't think they'd be terribly impressed with us, 
but we can go and examine the condition of the teeth once the skull is left and go and see how, they, how far down they've been worn. And that will give us a more accurate idea of how old this particular buffalo was. Right, we will be back, I promise. We will come back here towards the end of the sunrise safari. But for now, it's time for us to leave our lionesses, their cubs, and the big male lions to their breakfast. So well done to Abba Eyes. You ladies did a good job last night. It was not an easy one. But provided for the entire family, and whether they liked it or not, for the males as well. Who were sleeping off to the side. So one last view of our oldest set of Nkuhuma cubs and their gorgeous little faces complete with leaf in mouth <laughs> and then it's time for us to move off and since it is a very tricky position and there's a good chance that we're going to lose signal as we escape from this river system that we find ourselves in for now I'm going to send you back across to Brent and I will catch up with you a little bit later We have a lovely, great, big bird of prey. And I'm just having a quick look to get an idea. I know it's a bit difficult with the dull skies behind it. Aha, uh -huh, I know what it is. And I'm sure a few of you do as well. So there's a pair of them actually. So there's one there and one on the Scotia to the left. Let's just make sure they're the same species. And that they are. So I wonder if anyone out there can tell me what are these two eagles. If you know what these eagles are, pop an email to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live. Which eagles are these? And hopefully there could be a new one for some of your bird lists. I'm going to try and get a little bit closer. get ready to zoom if they fly. We're going to sneak, sneak closer. Now, whenever you see these eagles around, it's always worth checking very carefully if there's not a carcass about or in a tree. With the Basilea, they're quite often the first to find a kill. Being very, very, we're moving very, very, very slowly. I don't want to scare the eagle. There we go. There's a better view for the ID. Hopefully, you've got your bird books at hand. Uh, Michael, this could possibly be number 38 for you. While you look at the eagle, I'm just going to use my binoculars to look in some of the trees around, just in case they have located a leopard kill. We can't see anything just yet. Let's move forward a little bit. engine run. That, it, running the engine, the same principle with all, all creatures, just get them used to the sound before you start moving. And see, I'm moving slowly. Oh, don't fly, I don't want to disturb you. Just keep moving, I just want to, just, I'm just checking under the bushes, in the trees in case there is a leopard kill about. I, uh, I don't think so, but it pays to be prudent. So there's the second one on top of this Gorsha, or a weeping boar bean. Now 
magnificent birds, part of the Aquila eagles, the true eagles, with feathers all the way down their legs. Well, I think you've definitely had good enough views of these eagles to identify them, and I don't think that there is a, a leopard kill here. I'm hoping I'm wrong, and we'll spot one shortly. But let's keep moving. <laughs> Goodbye. <gasps> I nearly said its name, but I didn't. I remembered. Okay, so it has a nice big animal path that's frequented by lots of different creatures. And it looks like overnight it was frequented by elephants. Interesting, interesting. Let's just have a closer look at that. Oh, do, 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 Hmm. I'm, I'm very happy. Because I, I was actually sulking a bit earlier. And I was doing, showing Dave this face. I said, I'm going to start like this, but then we spot the eagles. Because I haven't found any tracks to follow. But I think that has just changed. Oh, dear. What's happened? I'm locked in. I'm going to have a quick look at the tracks. I'm looking oh, I'm just Sorry about that. I know you guys must have heard something horrible as that happened. There we go. And this looks to be a young male leopard. Possibly Cindile. Just judging by the size, it could obviously be another male, a young male leopard, we don't know. Maybe those tawny eagles are onto something after all. Okay, I just want to see. I just want to see if the track goes off that way. So, the last track I have is here. Let's just check on this side of the road. Where have you gone, mister? So when you see me dance with my foot, it means I've found a track. Definitely warrants more investigation. My binoculars quickly. Ah, it's just a funny shape in the tree. I, I got really excited there for a second. But these tracks definitely are, are from last night at some point. That uh, definitely warrants more investigation in this area. So our plan is, is I'm just going to check our east, I mean western boundary quickly, make sure the tracks don't cross. If they don't cross, then we're going to come back and check this area very carefully. Now the fact that there's two, two, oh, I nearly said the name of the eagle again. And two of those birds here could bode very well for us. Depending on what a leopard's caught, sometimes it's a bit heavy to lift a kill in the tree. Well, well done, Kyle, Stephanie, and Marianne. I'm now allowed to use the name of the eagle. It is a tawny eagle. Uh, along with the bachelier, they are often the first to find a kill. Very pretty bird. Okay. Oh, that one, oh, there we go. it's unfortunately a bit far from this camera, but that is a golden-breasted bunting. You can see that bright yellow chest. Okay. 
My bad, Mr. Bunting. We're looking for the upwards. Oh, before we go, just in case people are on the birding train today, that looks like a forktail drongo, but it's not. That is a southern black flycatcher. What's that running there? Oh, it's a monkey. A vervet monkey running along the ground. Now, that's good news and bad news. It could go either way. Um, next to the big tree on the right. Here we go. Whoop. An ascending monkey <laughs> having a look at us. So, if there is a leopard around, that monkey is going to let us know. Oh, we've got a wonderful bird party around here as well. And so we've got our eyes in the sky. Not Connor in the drone, but the velvet monkey in the tree. Yeah, it's eating some acacia gum. We can hear a crested barbet. Actually, let's just move forward slightly. We've got quite a bird party going on uh, to the left, the set frame. There we go. A common scimitable. And then to the right, we've got some white crowned helmet shrikes. No, that's the scimitable. Uh, and a white crowned helmet shrike next to it. Uh, up a bit. And it's a scimitable. And then just beyond it is the white crowned helmet shrike. And if we come out. To the left, and zoom, and up. Oh, there it went. There's the white crown helmet shrikes. You can hear a Cape turtle dove, which are opposite us on the ground. There's also, oh, okay. What you got there, Dan? That's the cape. Is it a cape? No, you're still on the white car and helmet shrikes. Okay, we're going to come out and to the left again and then up that tree to the top. Um, which tree? Uh, that, that tree. Up to the left. Oh, no, go to back down to that one. Sorry, I didn't spot that one yet. Oh, a brew brew shrike. Oh, off it went. Well spotted. And that's a Birchall starling. Oh, I wonder how many birds we're going to get out of this bird party. Oh, there's a dove trying to impress a lady. Yeah, keep going. A little bit to the left. A little bit more to the left. There we go, through the, through the, through the fallen tree. A little bit more to the left. Down. There we go. Look at There's a male Cape turtle dove trying to woo a female. She doesn't look like she's having any of it. Okay. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, Dave, quickly, quickly, quickly out. Um, back to the tree that had the white, uh, white crown helmet shrikes and the scimitable in it, uh, to the right, to the right. Um, not to the left, sorry, and there, yeah, you're right. Now spot, uh, where's he gone? The zoom. No, not that one. Just look for a flash of red. Where's he gone? Oh, I'm not going to find this guy. A red-headed weaver. Where did he pop to? Oh, come to the, to the right. He's jumped to the next tree. Zoom. And he's behind the main... St there he is. Red-headed weaver. Oh, 
I wonder how many species we're on already. He just jumped out, so let me just try and move forward a little bit. It's such an exquisite bird. Did you see where he went? And he's disappeared, but this is the bird party that keeps on giving. They've moved off a bit far now, but was that? I don't, I don't know. Let's just try and remember how many species we got there. Uh, Cape turtle dove, Birchill starling, Brew Brew shrike, white crowned helmet shrike, um, red headed weaver, common scimitar bull. Can you think of any more? Yeah. Did I mention shrike? Yes, oh, and uh, southern black fly catcher. That's pretty good going for one little bird party. Oh, golden-breasted bunting. Okay. So we are still looking for the leopard as well. But that was just too good a bird, bird party to pass up on. Definitely Sunday fun day for the birds of Juma. Ooh, I can hear a few more species. We're still going to try and sneak around the edge of this bird party. It was my plan to come here because we are looking to see if the tracks of that leopard cross out. And of course, almost every bird party is not complete without the fork-tailed drongo. Oh, off he goes. Lots of action going on here. Here's the Brubu Shrike. And he's much closer this time. Look at that. Oh. This is incredible. Sit and watch for a second. Right, let's go a bit closer. Oh, here's the redhead weaver right next to us. There he is. Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, who's quite new at the bird list, says, thanks for getting my bird list into the 60s. Well, my absolute pleasure. As you can see, I, I quite like bird watching, just a little. Just listening to see if I can catch another species or two. Ah, they're moving off, and we've got leopard to look for. I said, I just want to check quickly down here and see if those leopard tracks cross out of our traverse area. There is a pan over here, so there is water. So I just want to make sure that they don't go there. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ginny. Uh, Ginny says, it's so, it's so wonderful to see you get excite, as excited about birds as you do about wild dogs. It's very cute. Well, thanks very much, Ginny. And, oh no, that one kept flying. But hopefully, hopefully we're going to get a few more bird species. And maybe a leopard. Wouldn't it be nice while we're looking for birds to find a leopard? Well, Elinda says, kudos to the talented cameraman who's no longer known as Dave, 
known as Dangerous Dish. Uh, and she, Alinda says, uh, so talented, able to spot all the birds and move through the sighting so smoothly. So well done to Dave. And we're going to keep checking around here if we can find any more birds or hopefully young Cinderella. And while we do that, it's time to go see what Jamie's up to. Well, in this case, Jandre is definitely having a slightly easier job than Dave right now. He doesn't have to pick out something very small and very feathered and very flighty. Instead, we have two young bull elephants really enjoying a fallen knob thorn that's been pushed over by the rest of the herd. And these two little stragglers, I can hear the rest of the elephants off somewhere to the east of us. But these two little stragglers are enjoying their morning breakfast. And I'm hoping that since it is a cold morning out here in the African bush, that perhaps they'll give us a little bit of a sparring session. Oh, goodness. That was meant to stay in my ear. There we go. So a nice, peaceful turn that the morning has taken. And just enjoyable to sit and spend a little bit of time with these behemoths. moment they don't seem terribly interested in sparring with each other but instead focused on the knobthorn tree that's been pushed over now in the spring months around September October the knobthorns are the first trees to get their first new spring green leaves and as a result if you watch in spring they are the trees that immediately start to get hammered essentially by the elephants of the area what they do actually is they provide some serious help to the various browsers that aren't quite able to reach as high as the elephants are. Sorry, there's an interesting starting fight going on. <laughs> that's really interesting. So that's the Birchall starling, that's the largest starling. It's being chased by two greater blue eared starlings, which are much, much smaller. Well done, Jandre. Sorry, I know I said I was going to make your life easier than Dave's, I just made it harder. <laughs> Chandre proving how awesome his camera work skills are. Yeah, or not. Or, or not. <laughs> no, no, that was marvellous. I just found it fascinating that the, the smaller starlings were chasing the bigger starling. I think it was just advantage of numbers. Weren't they? I don't even know where they went. No, oh, I can sort of see them. One, yeah, I can sort of see them between the tree branches. Fascinating. Just goes to show there are certain species of bird that are aggressive and almost bullish in their approach. Starlings are one, um, barbets are another. Barbets I have seen a bully several different bird species. Drongos are definitely high up on the list. And then something we learned from Brent's sighting not too long ago, the lapwings that were chasing the little three-banded plover around the edge of Buffalo's of Dam. I mean, completely bizarre. And you watch them and you know that it's a, a sort of a product of competition, but I have no idea what upset those starlings so, except perhaps an invasion of personal space. But half the time they're quite content to sit with a sort of mixed combination of Birchall starling, Greater Blue-Eared, Cape Glossy, all together. And for some reason those two starlings took exception to their Birchall's friend. And all in all, our elephants haven't even bothered to look up. That nick is familiar in that ear. It looks as though somebody actually neatly cut a piece out of that. That's not what happened, of course. That is a naturally a natural shape. He probably pricked or cut himself in some way, and then the flies settled in, and the ticks settled in, and the bacteria settled in, and eventually ate away a piece of his ear that will be with him for the rest of his life. Or at least that scar will be with him for the rest of his life, making him easily identifiable. But that's a really, a really clear one. It really does look like somebody took a... Ooh, no, that gives me shivers. I don't mean it like that. Not harming him in any way. And will just mean that whenever we see this young bull, we will re immediately recognize him. Although we've got so many different elephant characters, it is completely impossible for us to keep track of them all. With the added fact that they intend to move and cover enormous distances. As I said, they've created a really nice situation here where they've pushed over a knobthorn tree, 
with some fresh green leaves at the top. They're not fully spring green yet, but they are fresh and they will be there will be other browsers coming here as soon as these gentlemen have finished. The Nyala, the Bushbuck, well no, not the Bushbuck in this area, but the Nyala and the Kudu and many other browsers will move in and start to feed off the freshly pushed over tree. And every now and again I just hear the crunching, toppling sound of another very large tree being catapulted over. The elephants are very much focused on the trees around here. And I mean, if you, we just look at the, if we examine the area that we're sitting in now, we've got the elephants feeding on a fresh knob thorn that they have pushed over. If we have a little bit of a look further to the left of them, there is a bush willow that has been mangled with branches falling down, and then the entire large bush willow, there we go, they've taken away most of the main stems of the new growth of a tree that has already been pushed over at some point in its life. And that's two trees next to each other. Then we've got chaos here. All elephant damage. Buffalo thorn has been completely mangled. Broken branches. And th that will result in the death of that buffalo thorn most likely. Okay, then that bush willow's escaped relatively unscathed for now. The other one has been completely mangled. And then we're not even getting to the other side of the road, which is just fallen stumps absolutely everywhere. Elephants are destructive feeders. That doesn't mean they're, that's a bad thing. And what I'm showing you is how much damage they can do to an area, but I'm not saying it's bad, because they've evolved alongside this ecosystem in order to keep it keep the system of checks and balances in place by destroying some of the trees and breaking them down and keeping them from basically what they do is they keep them from overwhelming the grass layer now kindness you want to know how big an elephant has to be before it can push down a tree um, it depends on the type of tree it depends on the size of the tree so I've seen little baby elephants push over saplings but that I don't think is what you're asking you wanting to know for a big solid grown, let's take an average size tree, let's get, let's go with not the huge one because that's a different matter. I mean that's a huge dead knob thorn. And they've killed this tree, but not through pushing it over. They've killed this tree by debarking it. So they've taken away the entire essentially the plant circulation system in removing its bark. So that tree is now dead, but that's not what kindness is asking. Kindness, the answer is for an average sized tree, and I mean I'm really going into very unscientific terms here because what's an average sized tree? Ah, oh, starlings are making a terrible noise. I'm trying to think of how to explain this in a good way. An average sized tree, you're probably looking at a 12 year old elephant. That they start to gain their full strength. And of course they continue to grow throughout their lives. These starlings are being so noisy. Now we've got the Birchels and the and the greater blue eared in one place. Chief as they were making a fantastic racket. Chirp. Having a serious conversation here. Hmm. I don't know what that was about. Little displays as well. Right. Are we done now? Are we finished? Sort of. Back to our elephant question and back to kindness's question. I'm sorry, kindness couldn't really answer you properly. An elephant continues to grow throughout its life and the bigger it gets the bigger the tree it can push down until you get the massive bull elephants that are close to six, seven, maybe even eight tons in weight, although those are, that's a particularly large bull that I would be referencing, and they can push down fully grown marula trees, knob thorn trees. The If you ever see it, and you will, kindness, if you keep watching you will see them push over trees you'll get an idea of just how phenomenally powerful they are. 
which makes the delicate stuff that they do, the sort of gentle touches of elephant to elephant with their trunks, or the stroking of a baby's head, or even just the plucking, the delicate plucking of a leaf or a tuba out of the ground, it makes the delicate work that they do even more awe-inspiring. It goes to show how multifaceted that trunk is as a tool. <clears throat> it is essentially a tool. Anything from drinking to eating, touching, visual communication, <clears throat> the trunk does it all. him crunching away. Oh, an animal of this size and with the elephant's digestive system, which we will go into in a moment, has to eat almost constantly in order to survive, essentially, and to maintain its body weight, particularly since obviously it's plant-based eating. And Stephen in the United Kingdom, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. I think Stephen this is the first time I've heard your name. Um, I think you might be a relatively new viewer so wonderful to have you on board. Stephen wants to know how many or how much an elephant has to eat before it is done for the day. The answer is they continue to eat throughout the day and it's usually around 5% of their body weight. For a big male that can mean about 300 odd kilograms of food, which is what, 650 odd pounds, somewhere around there, in terms of food. And interestingly enough, because of the way that an elephant's digestive system works, it's very inefficient. So they will defecate out about a, between a third to a half of that food that they've ingested during the day. It goes, their digestive system works very quickly, and it processes the food very quickly, but not very efficiently. Now these little elephants, it'll be much, much less. So if they are, oh, I don't know, let me guess at three and a half tons. Maybe a bit less, but let's say three and a half tons. Five percent of their body mass would be 150 odd kilograms, give or take. 150, 175 kilograms that this elephant would have to eat during a day. But they are not as big as a huge bull elephant. They're about half the size. They're still very, very young. It's roughly 5%, which means that the elephants need to eat con constantly. The only time that that formula does not apply is to young calves. Young calves that are still suckling, and they can suckle right up to the age of three, three and a half, depending upon the mother. Now, they don't need to eat as often because, of course, the milk is very, very rich in whatever nutrients they happen to need and even though they will be feeding on plant material by the time they are six months old the fact that they're supplementing it with mom's milk means that they don't have to eat as frequently which leaves more time for learning and exploring and adventuring and whatever else little baby elephants happen to be up to at the time oh someone's got an itchy ankle and resting his foot back down and elephants, despite their size, are surprisingly nimble creatures. Not something I ever thought I would describe an elephant as, nimble, but they are nimble. I've seen an elephant like about the size of this young bull. I've seen it during a game with another male. Push the male down and then climb with all four feet onto a big fallen marula. Look, the fourth foot didn't stay up on the marula for long. It had to put it back down again for, to balance it and then just left three feet on the fallen marula. But, I mean, it was basically an elephant climbing a tree, which definitely comes as a surprise for those who think that these creatures have to be sort of big and clumsy. And it's important to remember that because they're fast, and if you think you can out-dodge an elephant, you would be seriously mistaken, because you definitely, whilst you might be a little bit more agile, you are not as fast as an elephant, and you certainly... They can turn in the sort of... in their body length, if that makes any sense. They can basically spin on the spot. And then of course you had the elephant with Brent this morning giving you a demonstration of how they practice their agility. A little bit of yoga first thing in the morning is good for the elephant muscles. 
pig stretching up. Funnily enough, we just had this, Brent and myself and friends of ours just had this conversation where he was showing us pictures of an elephant doing something very similar. You know that the elephants are desperate for food when they are trying to reach up to the tippy tip tops of the trees that they are actually too big for them to push over. Hey big boy. The knob thorn is obviously well and truly done for because it's these elephants have been focused the entire time that we've been here on feeding on it. And welcome to Fuzz Man Sparkles. Our Fuzz Man Sparkles says, after the elephant and giraffe, what is the next biggest animal on Juma? Uh, Fuzz Man Sparkles, uh, it, the difficulty here is, are you talking in terms of height or are you talking in terms of mass? Because in terms of mass, it's the elephant, then a toss-up between a white rhinoceros and a hippopotamus. They come roughly into the same. So a big male hippopotamus will be slightly heavier than a female white rhinoceros. And then below that you get something like a, if we were fortunate enough, but I certainly have never seen any, any of them, but a black rhinoceros would come sort of close in for males. A giraffe will just top one ton if it is a really enormous giraffe. But if you're talking height-wise, which I'm assuming that you are, sure, we've got elephant, we've got giraffe, and then in terms of height, Brent. Brent. There we go. Well done, Jandre. Brent is the third on the list in terms of height. Jandre, aren't you roughly the same height? <laughs> and Brian's also, I think Brian might even be taller than Brent. So we've got um, a very tall camp. So in rough order, it goes elephant in terms of feeding height, because, of course, a giraffe is taller than, a, than an elephant from head height, but feeding height goes elephant, giraffe, and Brian, Brent, and Jandre, somewhere sort of roughly on that spectrum. Height-wise, in terms of feeding height, kudu would probably come quite close up in terms of height. They're taller, but a big, again, a big white rhinoceros would definitely have, give them a run for their money. But mass-wise, elephant, hippopotamus, rhinoceros, and the hippopotamus and rhinoceros is a toss-up, and then buffalo as well, and giraffe. So those would be the sort of the heaviest of the animals that we get out here, and then myself included, of course. <laughs> Definitely not. Somewhere with the dwarf mongoose. Somewhere with the dwarf mongoose, says jean -Dre. <laughs> Oh. Minor sparring session there. Kind of half-hearted, though. It was more a gentle shove out of the way, as if to say, actually, I kind of wanted to eat that leaf. I'm sure this is how these two came to fall behind the rest of the herd. And Ali, welcome on the Sunrise Safari. Lovely to have you on board. Ali says, yay, elephants. Are there any babies around? I am absolutely certain that there are babies around. They are not here, though. So these two boys, I think, have been sort of behind or moving behind a herd. What's it called? Following. Following behind a herd. And I'm sure that the breeding herd is off somewhere over there. And actually, to be honest, Ali, I was just about to say, I think that we should leave these two boys, unless they change their behavior dramatically in the next few seconds, I think we should leave these boys and go and search for the rest of the elephants that I can hear. Because I'm sure that it is a breeding herd that they've been following and therefore will have little ones around. Because I think Ali, like myself, loves to spend time with little baby elephants. They are just thoroughly by far the most entertaining creatures. And of course, the whole time I'm listening to the Game Graph channel to see when we can get back into that lion sighting once everybody's gone through and enjoyed their time and showed their guests that amazing experience. What do you think, misters? Can you point us in the direction of some baby elephants? Not that you're not wonderful. Hmm. I think they are far too focused on breakfast this morning to perhaps start playing, uh, sparring with each other. They're the right age. They're a very similar age. And a very similar size. Okay. Well, in 
that case, let us go and, and investigate and look a little bit further for where the rest of the elephant herd is. There's some cracking of branches over here towards Vulture's Nest. Perhaps we'll find, have some luck there. I do hear that Brent has been doing some interesting tracking. I'm looking forward to hearing how that's going. listening to the game drive channel at the same time. Right, where are these elephants? Oh, there. <laughs> Just to give you a long distance view, because I think that might be all that we get, unfortunately. Big grey shapes off in the distance. Can you see them at all, Jandre, from there? Far away. There we go. Two little ones firing off to the left, I think. A bit hard to tell at this distance, but that's what it looks like is happening. Oh, yep, that's definitely what's happening. And a female coming to investigate and make sure that they're not getting too rowdy. Well, we were right about the breeding herd. I was hoping they would be a little bit closer to the road, but we don't know how big this herd is, so let's go and see if there aren't some of them closer to where we can view them. Now, when I first started working here, of course, we could drive off-road for elephants. It is now our policy that because of the drought and because of the impact that we will have on the environment, we don't want to off-road more than necessary. We won't be off-roading for elephants. Let's go and see if they are around on Central Road as well. Perhaps it's a nice big herd with lots and lots of individuals. There might be some a little bit closer that we can see. Otherwise, well, such is life. I was speaking about the elephant's digestive system and back to sort of back to the question that Stephen asked. The reason that the elephant's digestive system is so ineffective is because it is what's known as a hindgut fermenter, which then answers Curtis's question, and thank you very much for sending that through, Curtis. Curtis wants to know if there are any bacteria in the elephant's intestines. Yes, that's how they digest the plant material. So unlike the ruminants, that most of the digestion happens in one of the four chambers of the stomach, whether it's the rumen or the um, reticulum or whatever else, omasum, whatever it happens to be, the, the sort of repeated chewing and the bacteria are mainly in the stomach itself. Whereas with elephants and zebra and hippopotamus to an extent, although hippos have to be remember are foregut fermenters rather than hindgut fermenters, they have plenty of bacteria that will break down the cellulose and the plant material for the elephant. So it is an almost, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. How unfortunate. I don't think I see any elephants here. There's absolutely no view of them from this road. We might have to go back to our boys. Yeah, nope, there's, there's, there's nothing here. <laughs> don't see any elephants. Let's just continue a little bit further up the road in case they've come out here. Now Curtis, one of the things that these bacteria do do in the hindgut of zebra and elephants is they... oh! Elephant! Here we go. Don't have to worry too much. 
it does produce a huge amount of gas, which is why elephants and zebra are quite bloated. Hippopotamus, it's less so because it's a foregut event. Oh! Oh! I'm still far away. What are you not giving me nonsense about? And now? And now what have you got to say? Don't cause trouble because your mom's going to come and want to see what's going on and how I've upset you. And I know you're full of nonsense because you're a little boy. Little teenage elephant. Yes, very big and brave. Very big and brave. Let's pretend you ran across the road for that tree. Yep, sure. I'm convinced. <laughs> that is called displacement behavior. And it means that our little male elephant is being full of nonsense. Very brave when mommy's next to you. I wonder if this is the same elephant that's been giving off... Oh, she just gave us a sideways look as if to say, don't mess with my, with my son. I wonder if it's the same elephant that's been having a weaning tantrum for the last two weeks. For the last two weeks, I've come upon elephant herds. Just watching her behavior for a moment before we reposition. Last two weeks we've been watching, whenever we see one particular elephant herd, it's got a cute little baby in it, but it's not um, Benjamin Button's herd. Benji's a little elephant we've come to know very well. But there's been an individual that has been having a serious weaning tantrum multiple times. What I mean by that is when elephants get to an age where mom no longer suckles them, the babies often don't take very kindly to this whole process. I see you, girl. It's all right. I'm just going to come a little bit further forward. That's all right. So I can see both you and your baby. You see that slight tilt. And there we go. The little bull has calmed down and is no longer being full of nonsense. Hey, little one. Oh yes, so baby elephants, when they are weaned, they don't take kindly to it. And what they do in response is they throw tantrums. Screaming, screeching tantrums. And most of the time, the squeals that you hear from elephants is actually the tantrums that they're having because their moms won't let them suckle. And they sound as though they're being grievous, they've been grievously injured or something when they do have these tantrums. And there's much squealing and shouting. The Jew that's full of nonsense. He's exactly the right age, just about three years old. Oh. Okay, we need to just fix something on the camera ever so quickly, and it does sound as though Brent is back from his tracking expedition. And we're going to send you across so he can tell you all about it and then catch up with you soon. Okay, guys, I've got lots of news, but I just need to chat to Orby in two seconds, so you're going to have to wait a second. Uh, Orbs, I found the Mermaid of Bamba. It's been jointed by Nisi uh, in the block between Sydney's Mighty and Wurtula Access. I'm just checking around towards Sandy Patch to see if I can find any more going on. Okay, so what happened is that hyenas have, looks like they've stolen that kill and I found drag marks, but then I found another set of drag marks. So the hyenas took the kill off there and I followed it up, but the left tracks are going that way. So it's hard ground, so I could see that they were definitely dragging a carcass, but I couldn't tell whether it was a hyena or a leopard until I found some soft ground. So I had to, <laughs> I had to follow it for about a half a kilometer before I found that confirmation that this had been stolen by hyenas. Now. There's another drag mark going the other way. So what I think has happened is the first drag mark is from where the leopard killed it and took it in. The second drag mark is from where the hyena stole it. Now, that took a little bit of puzzling, so hopefully the leopard's still in the area even though it's lost its kill. As I said, from the tracks, it looks like a young male. So quite possibly young Cinderella. 
And there's tracks again, but I know I had his tracks further up, so, and these are running tracks. So what we're going to do is we're going to head round. Everything seems to be pointing towards Sydney's waterhole or that area around Sandy Patch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Sandy Patch, and then if we get nothing there, we're going to work our way back through the block on foot uh, to see if we can maybe find that leopard. unfortunate and the tawny eagles are still around now it could just be a cold morning uh, but they're generally a very good omen when it comes to finding something check round now is the tawny eagle again and here we go it is a hyena track uh, i got very excited there because <laughs> unfortunately not let's keep checking now just an update i don't know if jamie's told you about what's happening on the dead elephant uh, on the dead elephant there are apparently 10 hyenas and lots of vultures so it seems very unlucky that this leopard happened to lose its kill to a hyena. And this is the absolutely riveting thing about being out every day, is you literally never know what you're going to see. You never know what's going to happen. And, and uh, as the great Hayden Turner says, you never know what's around the next corner. I'm checking all the termite mounds. Um, sometimes when, when leopards do lose their kills to hyenas, they manage to pull for a bit back, so it could be a leg in the tree somewhere. It's always quite dis a little bit disheartening when you find like, a drag mark, like, yes, leopard on a kill. And then you see that hyena paw print on top of it. You're like, oh, leopard had a kill. It's now the hyenas. There's the other tawny eagle still around here. A good spot to check for tracks here. Yeah? There's multiple big game pods that come out. Fingers crossed that the tracks don't head north. Oh, oh Murphy's Law. <laughs> there was a hornbill. Okay, so, no tracks so far, that's good. We don't want any tracks coming out of this area because then it leaves us a small little triangle of land uh, to track in uh, with not, not a massive area with no roads. So generally, it's nicer to follow tracks into small blocks between roads. Now, I have a 
quick look on the open area around Sydney's. Maybe the leopard decided to go for a drink, but I doubt it would have come here. There's lots of puddles around still. So here we go, the open air around Sydney's. I'm just checking very carefully along here. The ground's really hard, so it can make spotting a track a little difficult. It's a stick. Just checking along the dam wall sometimes. Cats like to lie on that damn wall. So you find me sitting in the middle of the parking lot of the DRC, which is also known as the Juma Research Camp, not the Democratic Republic of Congo. I don't have a cameraman. He's, I can see him running every now and again. He was running backwards and forwards there. And you just missed out on seeing Mama Z walk past. Mama Z? She's gone. Mama Z looks after us very, very well. And so, I find myself having to entertain you while Brent attempts to find signal, and we attempt to repair the problem with the camera. So, look at this. This is what happened. needs to do some stuff in the menus but we are sort of we can at least take you out of the DRC because Brent's got no signal and my car won't go into rip there it is there we go <laughs> oh. performing both roles I should basically just be a cameraman you want to go back <laughs> um, I do need you Chandra please don't leave me I don't know how to work anything else. I can turn it around. I mean, that's pretty complicated stuff on its own, especially when you're sitting on the seat that's it, that bread broke. And Rebecca said I was very good at turning the camera around. Thanks, Bex. I can point it in the right direction. This is the front, that's the back, and if you turn it, it shows you different things. That's my grasp of the way cameras work. It's a pleasure, Jandre. Any, if you need any advice, just let me know. I'm, I'm not an expert. Also, sometimes you can zoom in and out, but I can't do that without it going out of focus, so, you know. Moving on. We're slowly trending our way back in the hope that before the end of the sunrise safari, we will have a chance to get back towards the lion cubs. We're just waiting for everybody else to have a turn. Um, and there's been a little bit of a queue throughout the morning. As you can imagine, I mean, it's lions on a kill with males and cubs and everybody's got guests that really, really want to see it. 
No, we're just letting everybody, because we had such a spectacular sighting yesterday afternoon, we're letting everybody have their turn first. Bear with me, I'm just going to have a sip of my Milo before it gets cold. Okay, so you can, um, we're just trying to decide how we're going to go approach to doing, approach doing the menu changes um, to the camera. It has been decided that you will stay with us for until Brent gets his signal back. I don't know where he's disappeared to, but I was driving Wendy yesterday, so I know that there were, there were a couple of problem areas. Um, yes, the gate, the gate is one of them. Sydney's Dam is one of the problem areas. That was the worst thing about yesterday when we had that lion hunt and we were going black screen and I kept picking up my game drive comms and not pressing the, the microphone properly down to talk. Then, I forgot that I did this actually, it's the most embarrassing thing in the world. We were talking about planning our something, uh, I won't go into great detail, but we were talking about planning something and I'd had to leave the sighting to get round to take Brent's place and the directors were wondering if we could do something and I picked up the radio to answer them and I said no we can't whatever we can't because we can't do this for this reason but I did it all down the game drive channel I'd picked up the wrong radio mic and I, sp I said it to absolutely everyone listening to their game drive channels I mean you know cringe oh so embarrassing And in other wonderful news, jean will have his opportunity to do some menu fiddling because Jean, jean <laughs> Brent is back on the vehicle with some fresh tracks to show you. Let's head across all the way to the northwestern boundary to Sydney's Dam. So this is getting confusing to say the least. So I just came up towards the gate to do a quick check. Now I think I've got tracks of three different individual leopard at the moment. And I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. So I've got a male, big male, going towards Sibambili. I'm actually there. And then over here, tracks of a female coming onto Tuma. And then of course tracks of a young male just down there. I just want to make sure that this big male hasn't left our traverse area. And almost, just judging from the tracks, I'm trying to see if they're female tracks with the male tracks. And they could have been mating. And I don't think so. Ooh, no, but then you see a female track right there. It almost looks like they're mated here. And uh, it is quite a difficult little conundrum to solve at the moment. So let's have a quick look in front of the vehicle, see if the female tracks carry on, or they just met up with the male right here. So from what I can see, the female tracks don't carry on. So I'm going to make triple shore before we leave. Maybe she went down here. Okay. Very, very confusing. This is nice when they just pop out normally. Okay, so we're back to ground zero. There's a track going that way. There's a track going that way. So we've got tracks in all directions. Okay, let's go look again over here. So the only clear track I can see is of the female coming out. Sorry, I'll go around the front of the vehicle to make it a little bit easier for Dave. I probably parked in the worst position for Dave. And I got, I got excited while tracking. I 
No, if this, if this was a cartoon, you know, when you get the question mark above your head, that's what I would have at the moment. Question marks followed by an exclamation mark. So there are no tracks going that way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm going to check down here again very slowly. Uh, and then maybe check back up this way again. It's the Sunday morning brain teaser. This is really, really complicated. But my favorite type of brain teaser. Often at, at I'm at a loss. Oh dearie me, it seems as though Brent's signal isn't functioning very well. And my elephants have all disappeared. And vanished into some very thick vegetation. There's an elephant in the bush. But it is very, very hidden, and I'm sorry, I really need to listen to the game dive comms right now. I'm trying to listen to hear whether or not we can get you back into these lines before the end of the sun sunrise safari. There's a fantastic view of an elephant. Copy that, thank you so much. No rush for anyone involved, but it would be nice to just poke our nose back in. Hi, sorry, not listening. Okay, everybody stop talking now. Okay, I, I don't really know what the outcome of that was because it wasn't entirely clear. And the conversation seems to be that Ephraim is still waiting to come in as is Vernon, but Vernon is quite happy for us to go in ahead of him because he's going to stop for coffee for 15 minutes. I think that's what the outcome was, but there's still two vehicles in there, but they're going to be leaving at some point soon. I'm just going to keep listening until I get some clarifications. If I were a cartoon, I'd have a big question mark over my head. Just like Brent, but for different reasons. Let's go off in search of other things to keep you entertained since Brent doesn't have signal and he is attempting to track down whatever's happening with those tracks. And X Ranger has been very rude about Chandre's running style. Sorry, Chandre. Chandre's, Chandre's weeping quietly in the back at the comments made about his running. I thought it was very funny running, Chandre. <laughs> Poor Chandre is devastated. Oh, that's the button that turns it down. There we go, that's much better. Ah! I was just wondering why there were off-road tracks here.
And speaking of trees in the road, Felicity in New Zealand would like to know if there's anything house owners or farmers can do to protect trees from elephants. So there's a couple of questions in there. Farmers is a very interesting one because farmers involves not just trees but crops as well. And there are lots and lots of be methods being investigated in terms of how to reduce the um, conflicts between elephants and human beings. And we'll discuss this while we attempt to loop around this tree. It looks like it might be a slightly tricky process. So beehives is one of the natural approaches that uh, people have adopted. Obviously, I'm talking about approaches that don't involve harming the elephant. that actually landowners in reserves do as well. When they really have a lovely big tree that they really, really want to protect, um, the rubber tree being one example, because I know that that was quite a special one, but, good, goodness, goodness, I'm trying to get onto here. Standing by, sorry, I will get back to your question in a moment. We still can't quite go in just yet. Okay, um, so answer to your question, one thing I've seen landowners do or house owners is pack big sharp rocks around the big trees that they want to protect with a huge sort of radius to stop the elephants from walking on them. That doesn't work. Something we've been experimenting with recently has been spraying the trees, the big trees, with tannins. Because what happens when a tree gets fed on regularly by an elephant is that it starts to, or anything, it starts to release tannins that make it very bitter and unpleasant to taste. And the end result of that is that the elephant moves on and feeds somewhere else. So the idea is that by spraying it with tannins, it will help to reduce the impact that elephants have on the various trees. And from there, there's also an attempt to put creosote in tins and there's lots and lots of different approaches to trying to keep the elephants away from the larger tree species or the ornamental trees is a big one trees that are there placed there for their look most of them don't work uh, except for something like a chili plant or something similar Okay guys, we'll just have to wait until Brent is available because there's lots of communications that I've got to do on the Game Drive channel. But we will wait patiently and start heading towards Buffelzug Dam. Maybe some of the lions are trying to, or plan on heading there for a drink at some point. And a question from Dispatch wondering how we all stay so chipper first thing in the morning with um, very little sleep at night. Winter's actually absolutely fine, Dispatch. Winter is... Okay, just running to catch up with the rest of the herd. We'll stop here to look at the Impala so I can concentrate on listening to the game drive comms as well. Dispatch, winter's fine. Winter we actually get plenty of sleep. Um, it's not so, not too much of a problem when we start at half past six in the morning. Summer's a bit different because we get up at about half past four. 
and we generally are in bed after 10 o'clock, so uh, summer is a bit of a longer day. But I think for all of us, the natural excitement of coming out into the bush is something that motivates us and keeps us going. I don't find myself ever in a bad mood or miserable first thing in the morning, which I know that I'm, I'm very lucky to be in that position to face that sort of day and know that there's something exciting waiting for me on the other end. And it doesn't matter what kind of day it is, it doesn't matter if it's, as you said, funnily enough and predicted yesterday, the calm before the storm, which, by the way, I did remember and had a good chuckle about last night just before I went to bed. So it's, I think it's where we are. I think it's the environment that we live in and the lifestyle that we need, that early mornings are, and you have to be a, a, a sort of a morning bird to do this kind of work, and most of us are. I don't think any of us really have a massive problem in waking up every now and again. And when James gets back, I will most definitely have a lion at some point, as will Brent, since we've been doing a couple of drives straight. And it is, a, it is you don't really have a weekend or anything like that, not that that's a problem. But most definitely when James get back, gets back and there are more presenters on the ground, then we'll have a little bit of breathing space. And bye-bye to our Impala. It's... <laughs> okay, I need to hop onto the Gabe Drive channel, as I said. I've been sort of delaying to wait for Brent to get back on the vehicle. He is back up and running. Let's head over to him, and I will catch up with you, fingers crossed, with those lions. So, <laughs> finally figured out. Uh, I'm, I'm quite happy that I figured out the Sunday morning mystery crossword brain teaser slash uh, frustrator and uh, definitely a mating pair of leopards there so separate from the tracks we were following earlier and uh, they've crossed into Sibambili unfortunately but it looks like they were having honeymooning at the gallery gate last night so it took a while because the tracks going in all directions I'm going to take another swing down to where we had the other tracks. Just going to update the game drive channel. When they stop talking. Come on, there's got to be another leopard around here. There's three different sets of leopard tracks. I'm almost willing an impala into a tree at the moment. I think if we think hard enough, we'll find an impala, a tree climbing impala. Although I would, I would, I would accept tree climbing warthog, tree climbing steenbok, tree climbing diker. Any animal that's not supposed to be in a tree, I would accept high in the boughs of a tree at the moment. Milkberry, thick, difficult to see in. Maybe there's a milkberry there. I'm going to check it out with my binoculars. Okay. Uh, this is very wishful thinking, but as I said, maybe we'll wish. You see that dark green thicket of a tree? Now, if a leopard does put a kill in there, it is. Sometimes very difficult to spot. And with the marulas not having many leaves on them at the moment, any evergreen is a good spot for a leopard to pop a kill and keeps it in the shade and keeps it hidden from vultures. Alas, the milkberry is not holding a leopard. Okay, well, I think. I'm going to go to Aubrey's Road, <laughs> and maybe we'll get some luck there. Hi, Annette. Uh, remember, questions at wildearth.tv or hashtags for live. If you want to ask us a question about what's going on in the African bush, the comings and goings of our lions and leopards, the history of all the big cats in the area, Maybe we can vent our frustrations about how the leopards are avoiding us today. So if you 
have joined a little bit late or a little bit early, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, what has happened is that we found that I found a spot where a leopard had made a kill and then dragged it. And then before it managed to get it into a tree, a hyena stole it and dragged it off that way. And we came back and it looks like a young male leopard. And uh, then we went to check around the block and we found the tracks of an adult male and a female. And you can definitely see where they've been mating. But they unfortunately departed uh, to continue their honeymoon at Sibambili. And we are hoping that that young male leopard, the tracks we initially saw, is, uh, is still in this area. Well, a fine morning to you, Matt. Matt, I'd like to know, is it common for hyenas to take over a leopard kill? Very common. And one of the reasons leopard put their kills in trees where, when possible is to avoid losing their kill to a hyena. Okay, so I had another set of young male leopard tracks around here. Somewhere about here, if I remember correctly. There's so many tracks, it was difficult to work out which was the most fresh. So, you know, these I know are not fresh, they're probably from yesterday. Um, and there, were, there was some quite strong wind last night, and those tracks are suffering from wind damage. So, you're gonna have to take my word for it. Let me just see. Um, okay. Ah, there. Now, that is a young male leopard track, but you can see the edges aren't defined and that's due to the wind blowing over it. Okay, well, we know that's not from this morning. The other tracks we had were a bit better. And I'm hoping that if he did, or he did, definitely did lose his kill to the hyenas, that he decided the best direction to go was east. Now, this is complete guesswork, I do admit, but uh, as the old, the old saying goes, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Now, of course, it's better if you're lucky and good. Hi, Trina. Trina is in New Jersey. And Trina's wondering, do leopards ever team up or hunt together to get larger animals? Unfortunately, not. There are, there are very much solitary cats. Uh, they, we do see them together sometimes on kills. Males will often steal, a male leopard will often steal a kill from the female. And, uh, and also when they're mating, and, or when they're cubs and dominant male around. But generally they will do their hunting alone. I don't think there's ever been a recorded case of co cooperative hunting in leopards. Well, wouldn't that be exciting to be the first people to see it? Now, they've evolved to be non-cooperative hunters, and that's why they've got that dappled coat, and now perfect ambush or stalk predators, but, and that's why also why they try and keep their kill in a tree, they don't like sharing. Well, neither do lions, but they just beat each other up while, while sharing. I heard, might have been mistaken, I thought I heard a dwarf mongoose, but I can't see any. Now this is a favourite spot for Shadow. We found her sitting under that brown ivory tree quite a few times. Alas, not today. I don't think. I think yes. I think Aubrey's Road is a good a good gamble. Also give us a chance to have a look at the hyena dens, see if they possibly moved those dens from the Manuetti back onto Juma. Uh, these are the closest set of dens to the Manuetti boundary, so it's, it's quite likely if they are going to move the dens, it'll be to these dens first. So we're going to go have a squiz there. Uh, I'm probably not going to find too many adults around that den with a, a dead elephant less than two kilometers away. Hmm. 
quite a chilly, chilly morning. Well, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? I'm going to get a gap to show you. that incredible little ray of light piercing through the through the sky and while we go from a beautiful sky and Jamie's got some gorgeous cats gorgeous cats moving through a beautiful red and orange bush as one of the females slowly makes her way towards the Buffles Hook Dam area. Well, I say that, she's now just moved south, which was not what I was expecting her to do. But I think she might just be walking around some of the denser vegetation before she goes off and joins one of the males at Buffles Hook Dam. He is apparently there. Okay, let us see how we go in terms of our signal. You can accompany us down into the drainage system and you get an idea of the trickiness of this particular area. So everybody watch your heads. You got it, Chandra? Let us get a lay of the land here and decide where is going to be best. The reason I'm not rushing off to follow that lioness towards Buffalo Dam is because the vehicles are with them at the moment. So there's a lineup for that as well. Welcome to the Aubrey, Aubrey's Road. Sunday morning lottery. Uh, we're just going to try for the hyenas. We're going to try, hope that that young male leopard who lost his kill has come out into the east. Okay. Dum -dum 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 -dum. Well, it seems like the weather is playing havoc with our signal today. We do apologize for that. Darn you, clouds. Darn you. But Jamie has managed to get into a spot with good signal, so let's go back to the Inkahoomas. Oh, the little cubs have just been having such a special conversation with their mother. Utterly adorable, calling her with that sound that they make. Oh! <laughs> Collision course with one of the females. Listen to this. Some of those sounds that they make. They're just so incredibly special. <laughs> so playful. <laughs> I'm scared of repositioning, but I think that we're going to have to. I stopped here so that we had signal just so you could see them talking to their mum and each other. But now they've moved into a slightly trickier spot. I'm hoping we don't lose signal if we go a little bit further forward. Oh, battering each other. We won't go too far down. Let's, do, let's try it that way. We'll just go far enough that we can see. Oh goodness, VR rig. Oh, I have to turn on. Don't want to scratch the lenses at all. Ooh, just missed. Okay. 
How's your view there, Jandre? Keeps us a little bit higher. I want to go right down in there in case we lose signal. Let's just have a look. We've got a view of the little cubs. Let me take my foot off the brake, sorry. We've got a view of the little cubs. And whilst we don't have the best view of the kill, um, I think that most of you by now have got the idea if you were watching from the start of the Sunrise Safari. We do have the lioness feeding. I think that will be our approach. I think if we sit here and we can keep signal a little bit, it might be the best way of going about things. Amber Eyes is munching away. She definitely seemed to be the hungriest yesterday. Oh, little cub. Now, speaking about Amber Eyes and the fact that she very often initiates the hunts that the Inkahumas go on, Brenda, you wanted to know what position Amber Eyes adopted in the kill yesterday. Honestly, Brenda, it was so chaotic, I'm not 100% sure. I think that she might have been the one that was clinging to the top of the buffalo, but I really honestly don't know. I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to look back on the footage to try and see which lioness was where exactly Amber Eyes was in all of that chaos. It was just so much to, to look at and to watch and to concentrate on in terms of where we were driving that I really don't know. Jandre, I don't think you would have noticed either. Jandre was busy concentrating on filming. This little cub has found a stump, which might be the best toy ever invented. I love them, they're so cute. The way that they, they make anything a toy, it's just utterly adorable. This one's got a stump. The one on the right, I don't think Jandre has the best view of, but it's got a piece of bark that is now its chew toy. Ow! Oh. Ow! Oh. Such cute noises. Fierce little lion roars, sort of. And then Amber Eyes has shifted herself around to start feeding in the carcass. And since we were last here, they've devoured most of the neck and the muscles. They've started entering into the chest cavity. Just bear with me one second. I just need to chat to Vernon. I do, standing by. Absolutely, you're welcome to make your way. I think Ephraim's pulled out of this sighting just off on Yellow Road North. So you're welcome to come. It fiercely going about the very serious business of feeding, which is really tricky when you've got little baby milk teeth. <laughs> and it looks as though we're actually going to be able to spend the rest of the sunrise safari with these little things, which is so incredibly exciting. And here, another lioness. Can't see her at the moment. We are going to need to do some shuffling around, which means that I'm going to have to give up this position, and that could mean that we are going to lose our signal. So just bear that in mind. Vernon, I can hear on his way to come and join us. So when he does get here, we're going to have to move, and that might mean that we lose signal. I'm actually thinking of backing out of the sighting and letting him go in first. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that quickly first and for now while we do that I'm going to send you over to Brent so jump back on with him and then you'll be back on Rusty very very shortly so it seems like we played the wrong lottery numbers this morning because the Aubrey's Road lottery hyena den and the young male leopard tracks proved uh, to be a absolute failure but not completely because we now know for sure that both those hyena dens are not active. So while playing the lottery, let's go check the Gallagher shortcut hyena den. Now 
hopefully the cloud will break up and we'll have a beautiful evening for the sunset safari even if it doesn't it's always wonderful being out in the bush and uh, we are some of the very few people i think in the world who absolutely adore our jobs it is an absolute privilege to be able to go out every day and uh, privilege to be able to share it all with you I think if you asked me when I started my guiding career that I would be taking thousands of people on safari at one time, I would have, I would have probably chuckled and said, oh, this is not 2069, uh, but it's incredible that the, the technology that we have is, and we're able to share it with you wherever you might be in the world. Of course, we have an incredible team that makes that possible. And the tech department, led by Peter Brat, Alex, the Russian binary code reading genius, and of course, Connor, the muscular machine that keeps us on the road every day. Okay, spin the wheel of fortune into the Gallagher shortcut hyena den. Unfortunately not. Um, as we, if we have a look, no sign of fresh tracks around any of the burrows. So they're not here yet. Now hyenas have sometimes 20, 25 different den sites that they use. And as the fleas get bad, or there might be too many male lions hanging around, but they will move dens quite regularly. We, we were being quite spoiled for the fact that they stayed in certain dens for as long as they did. The interesting nest up there. Let's have a look. Is it a nest or is it a ball of twigs? Can you see it there, Dave? Yeah. It looks like a nest. It doesn't look like an active nest, though. Very difficult to say what bird species it is. It's quite big. Hmm. I have to keep an eye on that, especially as we go towards summer. Maybe we will find a, another bird for the list on top of a nest. Well done, Michael. Michael has managed to improve his bird list on this sunrise safari from 37 to 40. Well, Michael, the next big milestone in your birding list is 50. So hopefully uh, we're going to be able to produce 50 bird species for you. Oh. Why don't we try and find just one more, Michael, for your bird list today, as our leopard and hyena lottery has proved not too successful. I suppose if you compare tracking to the lottery, when you find those fresh tracks or whatnot, it's like that, that little prize that keeps you playing. And then... And then you get the lottery winner, which was certainly Jamie and jean -Gray. They won the grand, I don't, what do they call it? It's jackpot grand prize.
reprised down in the drainage. But let us be positive. We won the bird lottery this morning with that incredible bird party that just kept giving. And I know the red-headed weaver and the Boo Boo Shrike were new birds for Dave as well. Dave, have you got a bird list? Uh, not a formal one. Not a formal one, okay. He won for Michael. Now, the other thing I'm tempted to do is take it down the camera trap to check. What do you think? Should I take it down or should I leave it up for another night? How many nights has it been up? It's two. So, what do you guys think? Should we leave the camera trap up for another night or should we check it today? Uh, let me know. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wilder.tv. What we can do is go see if there's any animal tracks on the path to the camera trap to see if we want to take it down and check or leave it for a little while. Okay, let's inspect. Okay, let's inspect the path. Ooh, what tracks do we have? Looks like we definitely might have a civet. Or maybe even a honey badger or a porcupine. Something's been digging here. Mmm. Well, I'm not going to... Uh, I'm going to wait for you guys to let me know. Should we check or should we leave it another night? And in the meantime, let's go across to Jamie and the lions. We have amazing news. Not only do we have the little cubs feeding off the carcass, but the other two have come down and are barreling about with their mom. Oh, they've just vanished. That's what I was worried was going to happen, unfortunately. They have just started suckling at the back there. Oh, and they're, you know what? We said that they were a middle set. They're not. They're the same age, if not older than, the three that we've been seeing the whole time. We just didn't know that they existed, and they've been so skittish initially that we haven't got a good chance to see them. But to me, they are... There we go, hello. To me, they're actually bigger than the triplets that we thought were the ones that were born first. If not, it is very, very close in terms of age. <laughs> They're playing peekaboo with us. Look at them! The two cubs that we've hardly ever seen. Oh, come on, Amber Eyes. You can't be cross with two little cubs. Oh, they're so gorgeous. Hi, you two. <laughs> come say, come visit the carcass. Come see what's happening here with your cousins. And we finally managed to get ourselves some signal. We found ourselves in the perfect spot. And what absolutely a magical way to finish off our sunrise safari. Little cubs suckling on one side. Full lionesses. Amber eyes feeding away, sharing her personal space with two cubs that have their heads inside the buffalo jaw. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for an absolutely incredible image? And they're growling at each other. Already that instinct has kicked in. 
It goes to show how much of a lion's behavior is instinctive. Their natural reticence to approach a carcass and feed initially when the other lions are feeding, their fear of the males, and then the knowledge that they could comfortably approach, reading other, body, other lions' body language. They're only a couple of months old. Everything that we're seeing here is pure instinct. Sorry guys, here comes the male lion making his way down. I didn't see him initially. He is stopping to relieve himself and I'm trying to listen to the Game Drive channel again. I am so sorry. A Vernon Ephraim has pulled out. You're welcome to make your way in. Thank you for your space. Affirmative, that's going to be your best approach. Sorry guys, just chatting to Vernon on the Game Drive channel to let him know what his best approach is going to be. There's one little cub that's worrying me ever so slightly. And I'd noticed earlier that it was quite sleepy when we first got here. The little cub that's lying with the rest of the females, she, I think it's a she, not 100% sure, but does have a nasty limp. I don't know what kind of injury has been inflicted. Oh, here comes Amber Eyes and the male, looking at the male, standing by. A good point. I might have to squeeze past the other road that bits further to the south is now closed. So I might have to come back the way I came in. Uh, but you're welcome to pop in and then I will make a plan on the way out. Oh, there we go. Copy that, thank you. Sorry guys, it's a really tricky position to be in and being able to navigate around here is very, very difficult see how alert the lionesses are. And we only have just a few moments left with these lionesses. Look at that image of Amber Eyes, her face covered in gourd. And unfortunately we are running out of time to spend with these amazing lines, but I'm glad that we got to bring you back into this sighting once again. Just to spend as much time as possible with these amazing little creatures. And their mothers, of course, who were responsible for the meal that they have provided. And so we're coming to the end of our sunrise safari and we have to say a very big thank you to Jean-Dre for his fantastic camera work. We're going to not take you away or draw your eye away from this amazing scene. So a big thank you to Jean-Dre for his fantastic camera work as well as to Rebecca and to Chelsea in Final Control. Now I am also saying my goodbyes on behalf of Brent so a big thank you to Dave as well. And from both of us the biggest thank you goes to all of you watching this live safari every day, twice a day. Hope you have had an amazing time and you're enjoying these closing images. We will be back here for the start of the sunset safari. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day.